What'd you do, Mike? <laughs> I'm fired up. <laughs> I don't know about you. Run through a fucking wall for this man right now. <laughs> Larenega is going to join us in a second, but Stugatz has already flown off the handle and beaten you, Mike. Uh, he's just started paying attention, and the place that he's starting is Final Four. Yep. Stugatz is rushing. Wide open this he, year, Dan. He, he's rushing into the breach, and he's just going with the aggressive take of uh, it's the laziest take. It's Stugatz just <laughs> well, got here, you. and he says they're going to make their deepest run ever. <laughs> Just like he predicted the Dolphins would win the Super Bowl, it's the easiest thing. It's his laziest move locally. The quarterback got hurt. I mean, but just like I could that, do. But yeah. just like that, Stugatz has arrived in the conversation. Yep. It's glad to have you aboard watching Miami men's basketball. It's almost basketball. March. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Miami had been unbeaten at home, Stugatz. Uh, John Ruiz, their unlikable sugar daddy that is perfect to have at the center of this program because the Canes holes rally around him because he's – Daddy money bags. He's allegedly a billionaire, maybe a billionaire, kind of a billionaire. He's spending like he is a billionaire, and he's loud. He's brazen. Nobody's sure if he's for real. The echoes of Nevin Shapiro are all around here, but Miami has welcomed in somebody. Well, he's Miami. Who is aggressively outspoken, and Mike Ryan told you six months ago that Miami would be the first one hit with any of these bogus NIL. We don't know what the rules are, but we're going to start making them, and we're just going to make an example of Miami. Oddly, though, they did it with women's basketball, which caught me totally off guard. But it's the only place that we've actually gotten in trouble. If you remember, the women's basketball season started with a two-game suspension for Katie Meyer, and the school... Didn't announce what that was for, but it was it was over the pursuit of the Cavender twins. And this story comes out, and I just kind of roll my eyes out on it because it's engagement central. Basically, the NIL violations were that uh, John Ruiz hosted the Cavender family and was then using NIL to let get me, the Cavenders to just, come to the school. Let me just stop you real quick. The Cavender family, they're not just basketball players. They're also influencers. They have brand and they they have value uh, beyond basketball. Yeah, they have, they have a podcast. They had an NIL deal last season with the WWE. Uh, they have they're very popular on on uh, on TikTok, right? Uh, but uh, so the accusation is that uh, John Ruiz used NIL to convince them to come to Miami, and that's a shocker because no one does that in any of uh, athletics, right? You're not the way it's supposed to work is I come to Miami and then you present me the NIL deals. However, if this happened two weeks ago, it's a non-story because of what Ron DeSantis just signed, which means that the schools can actually broker NIL deals right now. So it's a big yawn, but it gets uh, aggregated and everyone thinks that, oh, naturally, John Ruiz is the first one to step in it, which honestly, just take Twitter away from the man. That I, I think that's the takeaway. Yeah. It, it's the photo on Twitter that, yeah. that makes it low-hanging fruit for the NCAA because they don't want to actually go after any of the football teams. It's also not what they actually got in trouble for, but okay. Okay, but let's let's uh, rewind for just a second because also this weekend— And by the way, I wasn't being dismissive of you. I was being dismissive of the reports and how everyone just assumed, oh, idiot, you posted this on, on Twitter and that's what you got pinched for. It's not what they got pinched for. John Go Ruiz, on. John Ruiz. We we will get more information on this from our UM insider in a second. <laughs> but uh, John Ruiz was also dumb this weekend because in the middle of the FSU Miami game, Stugat, mm -hmm. UM was winning by twenty three points. Yep. UM uh, it, teams with uh, that kind of lead, Stugatz, in the last one thousand two hundred thirty four games. Top twenty five teams have been one thousand two hundred thirty four and zero. Oh, in those games, Miami uh. Miami lost at home, lost unbeaten at home, a bad FSU team. You got to be careful with Leonard Hamilton. <laughs> a bad FSU team wins at the buzzer. I don't know how Miami got its last shot that wide open, and then FSU wins at the buzzer with a three. But when they were up 19, John Ruiz tweeted out the lamest possible FSU joke, which was FS who. <laughs> a and, classic uh, uh, classic uh, Ruiz yeah and of yeah. course uh, FS who comes back to defeat Miami <laughs> that one sucked <laughs> that, one, that, one, that one really sucked I left at halftime because I was trying to ah. squeeze in uh, Miami Canes hoops 
and you know, you're a Miami. person who lives in Miami watching a basketball game. No, no, no. Sorry, you know, I, low hanging. Fruit. You thought the game was yeah. over. No, right? no, no. I would have stayed Miami throughout the entire game. Early. I, ah, my, ha, ha. my soccer team, my professional soccer team that allegedly is called Miami, plays damn near Boca Raton. Right. So it's they, a hike, huh? Yeah. So yeah. I needed to <laughs> hit up both and be a, a great sports fan, actually. And I left at halftime because, oh, thankfully this game's in hand. So I'm going to take the opportunity to go up to Inter Miami. Mm -hmm. And we listened on the radio, and that was devastating. Carr went super hyped from Jordan Miller's three to dead silent. You were being you were being a great what you're telling us is by leaving at halftime, you were being the greatest sports fan. Yeah, because I wanted to support <laughs> both teams. That's what you're alleging. But most people would have picked one, Dan. No, but you but you said you left because they had a big league. You, you could have stayed later for that game and still made it on if, time. If, if the game were was, a tie game, Mike. If if the game were closer, I would have been like, we can't we can't leave. But I was like, oh, okay, great. They gave us this twenty five point lead. This is an opportunity to get to Drive Pink Stadium in time because it takes me an hour yeah. from Coral Gables to get up to that stadium, and I wanted to be able to hang out with friends that were that were out there, and you know. Do cafecito shots. I can't imagine as you're driving to Boca Raton, Joe Zagaki calling the Canes, blowing a 25 point lead. I didn't. I didn't hear. I couldn't find. I couldn't find what? Joe Zagaki. What? So I. So I just found the VUM broadcast, and I, I listened to two kids call it, which was. It's uh, the rule of the oh, boomer yes. jinx on Twitter. As soon as you see the tweet from the booster saying the corny joke, yeah. you know Miami's losing that game. It, I'm sorry. It's weird. I. I there were rivals. The, the same game happened last season where Miami almost came back from, from 25 down. FSU is the super long team, and Miami just decided to stop playing defense. But I was so devastated by that, Dan, I didn't check any college basketball scores after that. I was like, we just blew the ACC. I wanted this so bad. I went like 30 hours not knowing that Virginia had ended up losing to North Carolina and Miami can still win the ACC Co on Saturday. College basketball was great <laughs> this weekend. It was so much fun. Buzzer beaters all over the place. We'll get to Larinaga in a second. But uh, Chris Cody, uh, how confident do you feel in this fake Zagaki that uh, Mike Ryan could not find? He was so desperate because he's such a great sports fan. He was headed to a soccer game. Stugatz. He is claiming, Whittingham's claiming the same thing, that that soccer game has the most electric secret in all of South Florida sports. A little party in the corner. Uh, Chris Cody was saying, wait a minute, that one room, that one corner of one room, what are you talking about? Mike saying it's the greatest secret in South Florida partying. Well, during the game, it's an elite club that you have to have a certain ticket to get into, but I guess it opens up to everybody after the game, and I did not know this. You don't have the ticket during the game? I do not. Okay, uh, but, but it's open to you after the game. <laughs> well, one of <laughs> now the you know. But Mike has friends in town, and what one of them did, one of them Here's made the out. mistake, had never had cafecito before, had three of them, and is still pinballing all over South Florida, oh, unable, wow. unable to get to sleep. But uh, Chris Cody, how do you feel about your fake Joe Zagaki? It's okay. <laughs> That's all you've got. Though. It's actually not bad. <laughs> Let's get to Coach L. He must have been so mad. I know. Joe Zagaki, wherever it is that he was broadcasting. Where was he? I mean, he was broadcast. I saw him. He, his broadcast position's right in front of my seat. So, so I know he I'm was right calling here. the game somewhere, but <laughs> I couldn't find it. I went to. Uh, there's been so much you upkeep over. Yeah, right? it wasn't there. Really? No, it wasn't there. So I heard the VUM one. Huh? That sounds more like Harry Carey to me. Please stop. It's early. <laughs> Coach Larenega is there. Or Larenaga. We've got the Enye now over the N. I want to. It's not early for him. I, I want to I wanna know where. What kind of documentation, Coach? It's great seeing you. Uh, I think this is the best team you've ever had. It's certainly looking like it. Um, and congratulations on all your success this season, even though we're catching you at a brutal time. Uh, after a brutal loss, but the From first a cave, it looks like the too. first yeah. thing I wanted to ask you is uh, how much of your documentation has the Enya on it? Because you got to South Florida, uh, you remembered that there's an Enya on there, and where where in the house will we find the Enya? Any place I sign my signature. First of all, it's nice to be on, uh, guys. I appreciate you inviting me, and and uh, looking forward to uh, talking with you guys. But the Enya has always been a part of my name. I've always Signed my signature with the uh, tilde over the N. And uh, 
there was the guy who, who uh, I think it was a sports writer, who tried to research it to see if I ever used it before I got to Miami. And he got a, a he, he, he got a business card off of the internet. And sure enough, I had signed it and put the NA on. So it's always been there for me. Jim, I thought that you whitewashed it when you left South Florida. You left South Florida, and all of a sudden, you're the Enya was gone. You come back to South Florida now. You're saying the entire time you were signing things with the Enya. Absolutely, 100% of the time. Every time I signed a basketball or a photo of me and they asked for my autograph, there was always an Enya. You can look at it over the end. Bona fides. Yes, he is. He's giving me the, with a, with a, with a tilde over the end in yep. bona fides. Stay uh, strong, uh, coach. It's uh, not just uh, that though. There's a double R too, right, yeah. coach? So you have an R in there also. Can you roll your R's? Yeah, La Reñaga. There you go. <laughs> how is how good has your Spanish gotten in South Florida? Yeah, terrible. <laughs> uh, you're, do you agree with the assessment? Because you you look like you're on the cusp of winning the ACC. That seems unfathomable. The idea of of that Miami's not supposed to be with the blue bloods. Well, it is funny that you know Duke and, and Carolina. Actually, Carolina was preseason number one in the country, and in the ACC poll, it was Carolina Duke. You know, and if someone had told uh, me and Jeff Capel that Miami would be playing Pitt on the last day of the season to determine the, re determine the regular season champion. I think a lot of people would take that bet, but that's sure enough the case. We played Pitt six o'clock on Saturday. Whoever wins, wins the regular season title and the number one seed in the ACC tournament. So I'm real proud of these guys and the job they've done all season long. And it should be a very exciting game this Saturday. Coach, put us where you were when you learned that John Ruiz tweeted at halftime against FSU. FS who? Okay, I was here right now. I don't know that. Oh uh, no! Oh, oh no! You're um, informing me for oh, the no. first time. I don't. I don't really follow social media that much. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, someone has to tell me what's going on. So that's what you told me. And here's here's what I here's what I would say. I think the Miami FSU rivalry is a terrific one. I think it's it started with football, but it's permeated throughout our athletic department. So it was very, very important that we play well and win the game. Unfortunately, I think our guys thought we had won it by halftime because we had played so well in the first half. But Florida State, to their credit, came back, played a, a very good second half, you know, cut out into our lead and eventually made a game winning shot. So coach, it wasn't you know, just goes it, to them. It wasn't just your players. It was one of your very loud, obnoxious boosters. And I'm mm -hmm. not talking about John Ruiz. It was Mike Ryan who left uh, the uh, the facility. He left the the bedlam. You're up double digits. Mike Ryan left to go watch a soccer game. Yeah, yeah. I was being a good sports fan, yeah. Coach L. Uh, and also, one. let me because Dan just likes to make this horribly awkward for everybody. By the way, that sports writer that was trying to dig into your past was Dan. Levitard. That was not me. Yeah. It was Dan Levitard. It was not me. Uh, was. No, not I me. was. Uh, I, I'm a Golden K, and I love the program, Coach. And I, I like many Miami fans, uh, after that Dayton loss last year, was up in arms, wondering if the program was going in the right direction, wondering if you still had it. And I am taking this opportunity to publicly apologize to you directly to your face because I've gone from. I, what are we doing here? This is not the right direction to caping up for you in the Hall of Fame because I think you're a Hall of Fame coach. And the turnaround last year and the – I know everyone, including Jim Beheim, thinks that this happened overnight, but this was what the program was building towards. And you guys had a setback with the Adidas thing and the loss of scholarships. You're killing it, sir. You're a Hall of Famer. Well, thank you, Dan. I, I appreciate those comments, but really what I'm concerned about is getting ready for Saturday. All that other hype and stuff, it, it, it's meaningless. Right. Everything is about the players performing well during the game. And and the only focus is on the very next game. This happens to be our last regular season game. And it's for all the marbles. So yes. I'm excited about it. Our players are excited. <laughs> it's we for a share, the marbles. Marbles. A, a share of the marbles. A share of the marbles. It's a share of the marbles. All the marbles, many, coach. Many, Half many, the marbles. Many, Don't of, listen to them. Most of the marbles, many of the marbles. Not all the marbles. Yeah, well, sometimes I think I'm losing my marbles. <laughs> this guy gets it. Uh, so where are you, Stugatz? Where are you, Coach, on Stugatz's contention? Because he's been following you uh, deeply, profoundly, all emotionally yeah. all year, that this is a Final Four Miami team. 
Well, I think there are a lot of teams in the ACC and around the country that have the dream of getting to the Final Four. We're certainly one of them. And I think we're capable, but we have to be playing our best basketball, which means our defense has to be consistently good. Our rebounding has to be consistently good. And we've got to force a number of turnovers. Uh, at the offensive end, we've been very, very consistent. We're going to have to keep that going through the ACC tournament and the and the NCAA tournament. But we're one of many teams that has that potential. Jim, what were your thoughts when you read or heard that Jim Beheim said that Miami had bought a team? <laughs> uh, I don't really worry about what other coaches say or do. I just concentrate on doing my job the best I can, working with my players, getting them ready for the next game. I enjoy being around the guys. They keep me youthful. I'm not the youngest coach in the league, but I'm not the oldest either. Beheim has that, that <laughs> distinction. That a boy. Oh, bars. Yes. yes. He's got bars. Yes. <laughs> so, hey, this is this is one of those things that, that uh, the college basketball landscape has changed dramatically. The transfer portal, we had like 17 to 20 transfers in the league that are just absolutely killing it. Uh, so you have to be active in the transfer portal. NIL is a major factor. Every family wants to know what your NIL deals are. So those guys, I, my staff and I are not involved in NIL. We have nothing to do with it. So I just focus on the coaching. Jim, I do feel like you just age-shamed Jim Beheim, and you are our youngest guest that we have had in a week around here. <laughs> and I, I, I believe uh, I believe you did get the comments, though. You can laugh it off, and you can say, "Well, I'm not. I don't need to. You know, I don't need to create the headlines." But the idea that Jim Beheim would be saying that about your team when you've come down here and built something, I would understand in your most emotional moments, even if you don't want to, you know put lighter fluid on the flames, I would understand. Come on, Jim, what are you doing? You know how this game has been played for a long time. Well, he, here's, here's what I would say. 12 years ago, when I was offered the University of Miami head basketball job, I talked to my sons about, should I take this job or not? And my son Jay said to me, he's the assistant with the Los Angeles Clippers right now, and he said to me, Dad, it'd be so much fun to coach uh, at the Dean Dome and to coach at Cameron Indoor Stadium. And I said, Jay, it's only fun if you win. And I took the job and we've been winning. We, we're batting like 500 against Carolina and Duke. We've got the best uh, road record, I think, in, like, uh, in the ACC. And we're, we've got the best record. I think it's in the last, uh, I think it's, we're 35 and 10 in, in the last 45 games, something like that. And that's the best record in the ACC. So to me, it's all about staying focused, coaching my team, and winning. Jim, where does the high end for this team rank on the high ends of all the teams you've ever coached? Well, our 2013 team legitimately had a chance to win the national championship. We won the ACC regular season, the ACC tournament. We were seeded two in the NCAAs and uh, had Shane Larkin not got food poisoning and Reggie Johnson not tore up his knee and Duran Scott not caught an elbow and had to have his uh, jaw wired shut. I think we would have won the national championship in 2013 if we'd stayed healthy. Last year's team had a chance. We're up six against Kansas at halftime. Kansas blitzed us in the second half. Had we beaten Kansas, I think we would have had a very good chance of cutting down the nets. This year team, this year's team ranks right there with those guys. But the whole thing in the NCAA tournament is matchups. You got to be able to match up well. Last year's team matched up extremely well with our opponents. We were shorter but faster than the the teams we played until we met Kansas. You guys forced a lot of turnovers in the tournament, and I think uh, one of the things that the naysayers might say about your tournament chances this year is that you guys don't have enough defense. He kind of gave voice to that a little bit earlier in this interview. Can we turn up the defensive intensity because you're going to need to to make a deep run again? Yeah, there's no question it's our defense that, that needs to be the catalyst. When we're at our best, we're forcing turnovers, rebounding, and running. 
We've, we've been outstanding in the open court and our field goal percentage shows it. You know, we're scoring at a very high rate. The big term right now is points per possession. And we're doing a great job of scoring at a high level in points per possession. But a lot of our offense comes directly off our defense. So the more we, the more we, more we defend and force turnovers and rebound, the better our chances are. Coach, is Nigel Packett a play on Saturday? A lot of people were surprised that he didn't play against FSU. We could have we used him <laughs> against oh. uh, FSU big time. Yeah. Can we see him on Saturday? There's no question. Nigel, Nigel Pack's a terrific player, uh, a fantastic shooter. He made the adjustment from being a two guard to being a point guard. He's quarterbacked our team all season long. To lose your point guard in the second to last game of the season at home, was was really a challenge but the the injury he sustained is a day-to-day -day one and he could be feeling better today and and uh practice if not we'll rest him until he feels 100 percent because we need him on saturday and hopefully he will be 100 percent by saturday coach you talked about matchups what's the team the ideal matchup for this team is what or who well, it's not a particular team. It's actually a particular style. We, we, we match up very well with teams that are just a little slower. Maybe some big guys who don't run the court as well, or a, a, uh, a guard who can't get by and, and penetrate against our defense. You know, there are certain teams that you match up with that, that uh, you can utilize your speed better than you can against others. Jim, why did that happen last year where in the second half, or I should say, let me ask the question a different way. What will prevent this year's team from getting the doors blown off it in the second half because all of a sudden Kansas realizes, oh, wait, we could just leave an open three-point shooter at the top of the key. They're not quite deep enough right now to hang with us in the second half. Yeah, okay, so in the Kansas game very specifically, we got in foul trouble, which we hadn't done all season long. And we got in foul trouble because David McCormick, their 6'11", 250 or 60 pound center, was, was they went to him constantly in the paint. We were able to keep the ball out of the paint against North Carolina last year. We were able to keep the ball out of the paint against Auburn in the uh, second round and, and in the round of 32. We just couldn't keep David McCormick out of the paint. Kansas went to him, gotten in foul trouble, and we just couldn't overcome the foul trouble. And so why wouldn't that happen this year? Oh, we have no idea what's going to happen this year. Maybe we don't get in any foul trouble. Maybe we win by 20 points every game. I don't know. Nobody knows. what. That's why the games are so exciting. Who the <laughs> heck knows who's going to make a buzzer beater? You tell them, Coach. Who, yeah. who, who, who knows? That, you know, I told you in 2013, Shane Larkin got food poisoning and was sick. Duran Scott got an elbow in the jaw the day before and had to have his wire, his jaw wired shut. And Reggie Johnson tore his knee and had to have surgery. That all happened on the same day. Yeah. <laughs> Who can figure that stuff out? I don't have a crystal ball. You can. Dan, do you have a crystal no, ball? You're that so you right. Yeah, you're right. You know what? Survive in advance, you're coach. So I mean, right. that's what it's all you're, about. You're too yeah. kind a man to tell me what I deserve there, which is just fuck off, Lebetard. <laughs> like, just for real. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I got a good team. And you know sports. You've been covering for a long time. Fuck off. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I don't use that kind of language <laughs> in describing anything, Dan. You were thinking so I'll, about I'll, it. I'll, I'll be uh, very discreet and say, hey, we're going to give it our best shot every game we play. And whatever happens, you know, the truth be told. Uh, what does Jim Laranega truly righteous rage look like? Like when will well, we got a tech this when, year and it, 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 the entire <laughs> Watsco became unhinged. <laughs> Coach, I need you to get a tech on Saturday. Yes, yes, against yeah. Pittsburgh. Bring Prom us to life. Promise us a tech. One tech. Coach, say coño. Yeah, well, I, I, I got the, I got one tech this year, and that's the first in like five years. So, I, I like to keep it at a minimum. It felt good though, right? The tech. I mean. My players loved it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta will us to victory with a tech against Pitt. All right.
<laughs> See you later. <laughs> maybe, maybe draw some inspiration from Fran McCaffrey. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. Can, can yeah. we get you? Did you see? Did you see what the Iowa coach did? Did you see against Michigan State what he did? Stared down the referee for a better part of forty-five seconds. It, did it work? Yes, it did. It, it did, did work. They, they yeah. comeback. They were down ten with a minute and a half left, and they won the game yeah, in overtime. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see the game, but I saw the score and how they came from down eleven. But hey, crazy things happen in college basketball, and you see it. Jim, this good. past weekend there were a ton of, of buzzer beaters, including our game against FSU. Yes, your how does that one? After all these years, Jim. After all of these years, coaching games, winning games, losing games, random things happen. How does the night of sleep go after losing that way? There is no night of sleep. I, I can't sleep. Uh, I replay the game in my head all the time. And then I start getting ready for the next game. I try to figure out, okay, what do we need to do? I talk with my trainer. How's Nigel doing? We're going to have him back. Uh, I talk to my players. I text my players and, and you know, try to encourage them to, you know, enjoy, enjoy the day off on Sunday. But we're back to work on Monday, so... Hopefully we'll we'll have a terrific day today. Good seeing you, Jim. Congratulations on all the success, sir. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, guys. All right. Go Canes. Go Canes. Mm -hmm. You left it half, Coach. <laughs> we have weird psychopath shit going on here. We're just wearing two watches, one on each hand. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, He's a clock. So <laughs> I, I was given this uh, watch on my left wrist. I really like it. By who? Did the person nice die? No, my, my nah, parents gave it to it, me as a gift. Man. You're wearing four watches right no, I'm now? I'm wearing two watches right now. Two. Yeah. 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 One so, on each wrist. Yeah. So, I mean, frankly, here's what's, here's what's happening. I was given two gifts. Oh. So what happens when you what happens when you get given two gifts? It's you have to good boy sacrifice one for the other? Yes, you alternate yeah. days. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna use the Apple Watch uh on my on my right wrist. On my right Wait, wrist. This is an on. actual choice that you've made that you're gonna continue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna wear two watches now. I'm a two watch guy. <laughs> that's crazy. But well, why? That's weird, man. The well, watch. I don't I mean, want to they, call they, someone they weird. Serve, but they serve the different functions. They serve different functions. <laughs> so one tells time, and then one does all, all right. this. Tech well, the stuff other tells I time my, too. Your phone tells time. Yeah, yeah, my phone tells time. Do you still use the stove alarm now that you have two watches? Yes, I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just choose a watch, That's man. Weird. No, but it, but I I like Save that watches. one for fancy occasions and have that be like your everyday Steve wear Martin. watch. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I'm I'm enjoying the two for the moment. So uh, I I figured you did it because you were 15 minutes late for that first ever meeting we had the other day. Still scarred. And, and so he also bought a second stove. He yes. loves yeah. he, he loves a good meeting. Winningham loves to be at meeting. Love, love a good meeting. And I thought you were so mortified by being late for no. that that you put on a second yeah. uh, second watch. As you guys know, I'm going to start uh, working for Apple soon, uh, and my new friends at Apple sent me both an Apple Watch and an iPhone, and I would have been. I, I would have felt guilty had I not wow. used are you getting, their product. Are, are you getting all? Oh my God! Can you donate your old one to Roy? Yes. Ooh, please. Uh, we have. Se I, I know several people that could do with going from green text to blue text, but is Roy not on the top of the list? I mean, well, no. Roy. Roy. Roy is actually towards the very top of the list. You know, they don't know if you're wearing the watch, right? No, they know. I mean, I mean, they do, oh, but, they they're do not, but they're they not. But they're not checking. They don't care if Whitty's wearing the watch they do or not. Know. Oh, they know you should have regifted it for know. Christmas or something for like mm. someone that you like. They know. Fancy. They know if you're tracking. No, they're yeah. tracking him. But also, yeah. like, I, I'm going to be doing some on cameras, and presumably, if I'm like flailing my you wrist about, they they yeah. Want, don't flail your wrists about with two watches because okay, well, people I'll, are going to think that you're weirder when you but said it's penis. It's not the Apple Watch we're talking about. It's it's when you're wearing the Apple Watch. Don't wear this other watch. Yeah. That but I like it. There's. But I've I've only known two people in my life that have worn two watches simultaneously. One's you, and the other one's Ric Flair. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Lewis Hamilton did it as a bit last year, but again, a bit. I mean, Whittingham says this is it. This is the move. He doesn't care what anybody says. Uh, Whittingham, Whittingham does march to his own drummer. He doesn't care how much ridicule he gets. He has decided he is going to be a two watch man. Well, so what are you going to do with the phone? Are you going to use it? Can I can I betray Stuart? Can I betray your confidence here? Sure. Stugatz for years locally there was like this deal with Metro PCS and for whatever reason he got a free Metro PCS phone. Yep. And he just I think wanted to have the Metro PCS phone because he didn't use it and every so often I would get a call from Stugatz I would say Stugatz Metro 
And he's like, hey, buddy, just checking in with you. We got to talk for 10 minutes on this phone or they're going to take it away. And I'm like, but why do you need this phone if you don't want I it? I had to show Metro PCS I was using the product. But you, you didn't know? want it was a big to deal use the, the product. Yeah. Do, do you think they got right. a, I mean, they get a phone PCS. bill at the yeah. end of every month? <laughs> I'm wondering. <laughs> like, do you think they were checking you on how much you were, were. using your phone? They were checking? They were checking. They actually were really? checking. Yes, we did a big deal with Metro PCS. They gave me a phone. I didn't want to use the phone. So I used it to call Billy every now and again. Wait, so I mean, this is okay. So you were getting, to log some minutes. You, you know were what getting I'm paid on the side for using their phone. I'm assuming, or not on the side, but you were getting something for part using. of the deal. So yeah, so you needed to use that phone. So every once in a while, he just call me, and I'm like, "Well, what's up?" And he's like, "Just gotta talk to you for 12 minutes here, bud." <laughs> Can we get a list? Can we get Stugantz to just give us a list of his lifetime scams? Because I also imagine that what he was doing is when he's driving around, he's just calling somebody and then throwing the phone on the seat next to him and just. <laughs> Pretending like he's on the phone while he's on other calls. I, I, can we get a list somehow? Because I, I do believe Billy, I, without asking, that if you were to say, "Can I betray you on something?" that you would have a cornucopia. You would have just as good a list as Stugatz on oh, what no, the scams are. Oh no, but like are. I know the betrayals for you know entertainment purposes and the betrayals for the lawsuits. Like I know which betrayals you know where, out there. You know, yeah, you know where the lines are. Yeah, on I these. know where the lines are. I know where my bread is buttered. <laughs> okay. Got to save some of those for the rainy day. Just don't mention the Cayman Islands. <laughs> I don't know if Stugatz uh, saw one of these stories from this weekend locally, but I had been wondering, and this was something I thought that was being said around here awfully coldly last year, as we got ratcheted up on all things Dolphins, Stugatz, I was under the impression that the team was built to be elite at pass rush and elite in the secondary. And we and everyone else, a lot of other shows, were mentioning, well, they were counting on Byron Jones. They're paying Byron Jones a lot of money. Xavier Howard noticed how much Byron Jones was making. Byron Jones is really important to everything the Dolphins are doing. He's not available. He's not talking. Where is he? What happened? What's the plan? And then this weekend, Byron Jones says, I can't run, says it on Twitter. I can't jump. Don't take any of the pills they tell you to take. Don't take any of the injections they tell you to take. And I hadn't heard that from that dude in any way in a really long time. He was super important to things the Dolphins were doing. He became invisible as soon as he was injured. And now he says, oh, wait a minute. This sport and everybody bleeped me up. I can't run and I can't jump. I didn't know that was so about Byron Jones. I was expecting him to be great next year. I was expecting him to be like great last year. I saw him be great the year before that. What the hell happened? Football. I mean, football happened. He's injured. And I think the shocking thing about Byron Jones and what he's doing and what he's saying is he's actually lending a voice. Hey, the things that allow me to get back on the field every Sunday to play this game, don't take them. Don't take those yeah. things. I don't hear players saying that. I hear players saying it's a deli line to get that stuff so they can play. So this is what happened on Twitter. Dan paraphrased, but it was a part of a, a string. And he was retweeting uh, the NFL uh, bragging about his broad jump in the combine because it's combine week. And he retweeted with comment, much has changed in eight years today. I can't run or jump because of my injury sustained playing the game. Do not, in caps, take the pills they give you. Do not, once again in caps, take the injections they give you. If you absolutely must, consult an outside doctor to learn about the long-term implications. And then he followed that comment up with, it was an honor and a privilege to play in the NFL, but it came at a regrettable cost I did not foresee. In my opinion, no amount of professional success or financial gain is worth avoidable chronic pain and disabilities. Godspeed to the draft class of 2023. Reporters have reached out, and he has said he's not retiring, that that's not him announcing to everybody that he's retiring. But again, I thought that this was a pivotal piece as part of their future. I thought this was somebody, this would be a reason that you're paying Vic Fangio $4.5 million a year because you believe that your secondary can be elite, but without this guy, it can't be. I mean, Howard was less good last year. Holland is great, but also hurt. And and, and Byron Jones was supposed, he's paid like a centerpiece. And this, I can't believe the, the, the way the dominoes fell on this, where it's silent, silent, silence. Where is he? Unavailable, unavailable. Oh, bombshell. Doctors wrecked me. And I think now the Dolph, I think part of bringing Fink, uh, Vic Fangio in is that they have to now figure out 
what they're going to do without the defensive game plan they had in place for the last two years. Because the last two years, it was, we're going to run a very blitz-heavy scheme, and Xavier Howard and Byron Jones will cover all of the gaps that are left behind by us sending numbers into the blitz, and now they they have to figure out a completely new way of playing defense, and that's Vic Fangio's job. To me, the interesting thing was to track, well, wh- how was Byron Jones 2021? Because he was fine, he played very well. He was a key part of that secondary. If you go back and look at that season, at one point he was ruled out with both Achilles and groin injuries. And so what in the 2021 season were they trying to get him back on the field with? How were the Dolphins treating him? Or was or did this happen at the previous stop in Dallas where he was being injected with stuff that kept him going? At what point was he mistreated? And did that lead to inevitably him sitting out the 2022 season because I can't do this anymore? He signed a five-year, $82.5 million contract, 57 of it guaranteed. Xavier Howard noticed it right away, and they yes. redid his deal because of it, because Howard was supposed to be the better corner. I just, I just will ask the audience again, because I haven't seen a whole lot like it. We covered the holy hell out of this team this year. How does this happen quietly? Like, he's kind of important. And we just shrugged. The quarterback was constantly getting concussion issues and kind of became like the talk of the league. Should he be playing or not? I mean, we, we we talked a little bit about his absence and how the the Dolphins' defense was getting crushed at one point when a centerpiece of their strategy was gone. But th- the idea that it was because they mistreated him or because he was being asked to take injections that he didn't want to take or that the the injury was more severe than we even realized. It kind of reminds of what's going on right now with Lonzo Ball with the Chicago Bulls, where he can't even run, and he had like a knee procedure that was supposed to keep him out for three weeks, and he's missed a year. To me, this is just the uh, Neil Brennan thing. Football thing happens to football player. I mean, this is this even a story? I'm sure every team in the league has a player who's just got injuries now and can't walk without pain, and it's just it sucks for him. I'm not like I'm not dismissing it, but it's just. Is this even news? It's just this This game hurts, and one guy right now on your team is going to end up with chronic pain, and it sucks. You're saying, is it news that a centerpiece of your franchise is saying don't trust the doctors, don't trust the teams? You're, you're well, shrugged. he's just frustrated. I just think he's frustrated. He's like, man, I've been hurt for a year. I want to be back, and I'm still in pain. Like, I don't know what the response is. I don't know what the – how do we fix this? It's just football. Like, it's going to happen to somebody. It just sucks for the Dolphins. It's a key piece. But there's a disconnect between you, the fan, the customer, and pain. A guy is telling you that they all want to get back on the field for it, for you, for money, blah, 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 blah. And this one's telling you, who was paid a lot of money, he got his guaranteed money. $57 million. He got his money. He's still telling you not worth it. He ain't even old yet. I think there is a disconnect on how much pain these people endure. And you guys make fun of me all the time for, well, they made the choice. Made the choice. And I'm like, it's inhumane. They made the choice. Well, he didn't know the choice he was making because he's telling you right now. And you could question it. Sugat. You could say, oh, he wouldn't give back that money. Maybe he wouldn't. But he's got a lot more years of whatever it is that he's enduring right now. And he's already telling you out loud. You don't think it's news? Man, you're numb to the pain of these people if you don't think it's news for that guy making that money to tell you, I'm in too much pain. It wasn't worth it. I mean, he's 30 years old. And he does have enough guaranteed money where if he stopped today, he'd be fine for the remainder of his life. Well, fine if you think it's fine to have pain the remainder of your life. Correct, yes. He's also not retiring, which makes the, the story even stranger. Well, right? he's got he's got probably more money that he's owed whether he can play or not. And I, I just think there is a disconnect between how much we love this thing. And I, I think he's... Unusual in saying it out loud that way, but I think a lot of these guys are just now realizing, as there's more and more information, what it is that that money pays for. We had Sam Shields on South Beach Sessions a few months ago, and he was the first person I've ever have heard give voice to, don't do this. I, I wouldn't do it again. What it takes is not worth it, and this is the second. Well, he's not even saying, I don't think football is worth it. He's saying the injections aren't worth it and the long-term effects of that. Maybe he's saying go about alternate ways of trying to heal yourself or quiet the pain rather than the Toradol shots. But hes I don't think he's even saying that football did this. He's just saying that don't take the pain shots. They could, they could ruin your life. But 
I, I think that it would really take a, a critical mass exodus of top-level players leaving the game for, I think, anyone to really stop and go, wait, hang on a second, what are we doing? Uh, I mean, maybe our, our government leaders, but I, I imagine how politically unpopular it would be but, if government leaders, let's do an investigation into football and see if we should stop but this. Ma how, how mass does the exodus have to be? Because you do have more players than ever retiring early. Right. Andrew Luck included. But there's, but there's enough great players to produce a great product every Sunday. That don't and but, that but and that actively sort of spit in the face of that whole notion. Oh, I'm going to retire. No, I'm tough. I'm going to do this. But it's rare to hear because we've had countless players on this show throughout the years, Jason Taylor included, saying, "Yeah, I'd sign up and do it all over again. All of it, the shots, everything, every single aspect of it." And so it's weird. It's odd to hear a guy say, "Hey, don't take that stuff." Well, he's still under contract. Is the other thing. It's not like he's saying it from retirement or the beyond or another team. Yeah, there, he's probably financially incentivized to not say <laughs> that he's retiring because if he says that he's retiring, then it's less money. I think this goes hand in hand with the Tua conversation all season. It's the way the NFL deals with injuries and puts players back on the field. We watched Patrick Mahomes play a Super Bowl this year with a fractured high ankle sprain. And I think uh, on the media's part, maybe we shouldn't glorify a player being tough and going back out there after getting injections at halftime. Well, because Stugatz wouldn't glorify him. Stugatz was ripping him for, well, for milking it. I did glorify him, though. Like That was incredibly impressive. And again, it's his choice if that's what he wants to do. And I think hearing the other side is important. It's not... It's not the best thing for every player, especially players that have seen the ugly side of it. I think it's important to hear both sides of it, and I I don't know if there's an answer other than the way that we you know evaluate players with injuries from a media standpoint should be a, a little bit more understanding than like oh you know we were just talking about a, a basketball player who didn't play this weekend and and fans calling him soft like we don't know what that person is going through we don't know what they've done to their bodies to try to get ready to play in a game. Yeah, we've seen it with Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. Lamar Jackson gets hit with all sorts of criticism, and Patrick Mahomes gets elevated to, yeah, that's what your franchise quarterback does, even though there's a stark difference in that one got his big contract, the other one's trying to secure that bag. I also think it's uh, the, the point being made about seeing an independent doctor is a really important one, because if you're just listening to the team doctor and the team trainers, those people are paid by your, by your club and by the NFL. They have incentivized to get you back on the field. Of course. I think it's imp important for a, an ex-player or a current player to say, hey, know your options. Get a second opinion. It's not easy for everyone. I'm sure it's it's not, you know, uh, endorsed by your team. But if that is something you care about, it's super important to see all the angles of it's it. It's hard to do, though, because I do remember uh, my original agent played for the Dolphins and went up against Jimmy Johnson in what he deemed to be cruelties that were being thrust upon the players in practices, and then he publicly criticized it, and the practices got harder. It's a real, it's a real hard situation. And then his teammates hated him. That's correct. Yes. It's a, re it's a real difficult situation when the entire construct of the machine is incentivized to meet, to to feed the machine. But uh, in keeping with what you were saying, Jessica, we don't know what these guys are th going through. Locally, some people may have heard this story. Nationally, I suspect they have not. The Spencer Knight story with the Panthers, Dugats, the goalkeeper for the Panthers, uh, what they have said publicly is that the NHLPA and the NHL are working with him to assist him and to give him care. I don't know what is real on the reporting on what triggered this in the locker room. Some people are talking about things that happened in the locker room. I immediately jumped to when only seeing the press release to God's, oh, this is substance abuse. I just left. I shouldn't have. But that's where I went. And it might not be. It might just be care. But I don't know enough about this story. And I don't totally trust the reporting. And we should be we should respect the privacy of someone going through it. Like I don't actually want to. Well, then let's respect the privacy because we can't. There, it's collectively bargained that Spencer Knight is entitled to his privacy, both personally and professionally. I'm sure he wants his privacy because he stepped away from the game to get help with whatever is it is that they're that they're dealing with right now. And I can't. I I think it's totally irresponsible for me to. 
ponder aloud and workshop hypotheticals. I just hope Spencer Knight gets better. He's I'm a, just telling you what my honest reaction was. I see a press release. I don't know what happened. They're treating it publicly with care. Yeah, I, I understand, like, thinking that, too, because I guess I'm a little older, and whenever I see something like that, I automatically always used to default to, oh, is is this substance, too? Because that's what it always was when I was growing up. And now, recently, my mind has shifted on this. that because yeah. there's, there's other ways that the leagues have done a much better job in being able to allow and, and, and have these programs where players can get the help that they need. It's a really tough sport to admit that you need any kind of help in. This is like the uber-masculine yeah. sport, tough guys, hockey player, all the cliches. So for someone to step up and admit that they need help with something, no matter what that thing may be, is really difficult to do in that sport in particular. I have always thought, incidentally, lest you think that I am jumping to a judgmental com uh, conclusion with substance abuse, I've always thought in those sports where pain must be managed that it's the easiest thing in the world to help soothe yourself, whether it's mental pain, emotional pain, or physical pain, with whatever substances are before you realize, oh, Oh, I've got a problem. I need these things in order to keep – it's part of my care. Uh, the, I don't actually blame anyone who succumbs with the to the self-medicating of – Well, we, we also don't know it's that. Yeah. No, no, so. I'm not, no, but what I, I'm – Mike is making the point, don't jump to that conclusion. And what I'm saying is it's been the mask before – it's been the mask for this stuff for a long time, for whatever it is that requires care from the NHL PH, uh, the NHL uh, Players Association and the NHL, that I believe those people are now learning, learning in front of us, Dugats. Oh, we have to treat all this stuff. People over the last three years are suffering from ailments. Uh, you know, they have been for a long time, but all of this stuff is now more in the public than it's ever been, whether it's DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love coming out and giving voice uh, to, we need help with some things. It, it, I imagine, as, just as a professional, Spencer Knight is 21 years old, and he's been on a pro roster for two seasons now, highly touted, uh, plenty of appearances for the U.S. national team. Like, he's... He's supposed to be the next great thing in, in, in goaltending, and it hasn't quite gone that way just yet for Spencer Knight. And there's a lot of reasons why it's difficult to just be 21 now. And with all that immense pressure associated with the, the career expectations, I'm glad that Spencer Knight, whatever he's going through, is seeking the help. And I wish that people wouldn't stigmatize it as much. And we have to kind of deprogram ourselves from doing what – you're inherently doing, which is trying to figure out how do we explore this? How do we talk about this? And sometimes if Spencer and I want to talk about it, when he comes back, he'll talk about it when he's ready and then we can do it. But I think, I think we're doing a disservice to the entire mental health conversation. If we start taking it to these extremes, the NHLPA hasn't said, and I know that's not what you were doing, but you were like, well, in these instances, you can self medicate to find the help. We don't know if it's either or, and we certainly don't know if it's both. We don't know what's going on. And I think we should, Give Spencer Knight the privacy that he needs, and if and when he comes back to the organization, if he feels the the need to discuss that, to further destigmatize it, it's a welcome conversation. You do realize that that treatment of it is different than we've ever done it. That represents because— That's prog progress. That's prog a good shift, Progress though. is, yes, of course. That is what progress ends up looking like. That's something that has always been in the shadows that you are not to share with anybody. Whatever the thing because is, I fear because that if, it represents weakness. Right. And I fear if we take that to that extreme and we talk about all the weakness associated with it, understanding that we're coming at it from a point saying there shouldn't be, but we're not doing that conversation any favors when that's immediately where we go. And programs like this and other uh, media entities that cover hockey, I hope are uh, treating it with that kind of responsibility because I want the next person to feel whatever Spencer Knight is going through to feel like it's a welcome atmosphere to come out and get help. You say that, but you saw what happened with Simone Biles where it there was a turbulence on Simone Biles before we arrived at the point, oh, yes, we should be understanding. We should be human. We should be decent. She's doing flips in the air. She's not right mentally. She knows better than us. We should not question her courage. We're talking about an athlete that most of the people listening to this don't know plays behind a mask. But are we going to show that kind of respect when 
somebody, same set of circumstances, all of them the same, whatever the hypotheticals are, but now player X not available because player X is going through private What kind of respect? Issues. I, I don't... Like of respecting the privacy, well, we're of not, legitimately though. respecting we're the not. privacy by, by by discussing it. We're we're not. I don't think that we've actually uh, offered up that much respect to what Spencer Knight is going through through this prism. I think it's incumbent upon programs like this to avoid the. I know it's tantalizing. We're in the content game, and we want to make a conversation about this. If you want to make a conversation out of the reaction to Simone, yeah, go for it. If you want to make content out of the reaction to Spencer Knight, go ahead, go for it. I haven't really seen. That I've seen people be irresponsible on on social media. I just think you say it, if, if it's a news item, you report on the news and what you know, which is nothing. But and, Mike, you, and you just but encourage did, anybody to come forward and seek help but because did, I think it's we're, we have a responsibility to dis, desigmatize this stuff. But Dan saying we're being gentle on a guy that barely anyone knows. Are we going to react the same? I don't know. Jimmy Butler decides Eastern Conference Finals Game we 6. We did. Well, not Game 6, but Jimmy Butler had plenty of personal time. Kyle Lowry had a lot of personal time, but this is a shift, Stugatz. This is a, a this, is, this is a different thing than it has ever, than it has ever been uh, before, and it has an assortment of challenges in it uh, for people who are learning how to navigate those challenges because this is the same franchise i don't need to remind you that did not know how to deal with a sex scandal in in any that was last year that was last year this this is this is a environment the youth hockey environment is one that has a whole lot of garbage in it that can mess up all sorts of people on the chase toward whatever it is that stardom represents in that sport. This represents a seismic shift in the organization that its coach, its legendary coach last year, went out in a giant scandal because of how bad the pipeline is in this sport. Um, it is nice to see this kind of, genuinely nice to see this kind of progress where people can uh, can take care, can put in the press release that the NFLPA or the NHLPA and the NHL working together to take care. It's not a normal. It's it's the new normal. It has not been the normal. Can I drag it back to just a couple of years ago? The Panthers suck, huh? Yeah. Why are they so bad this year? <laughs> I mean, they won the Biden Cup last year. Now yeah. what? Why are the Sesta Cyclones so bad this year? <laughs> now don't get me started on this. Now we got a biggie today. Well, you're responsible. You drafted the yeah, team. You're the owner. You it's are fine. the one that we right. would get started on this. Why awfully are they quiet. so bad? It's awfully a- quiet all year on the Sesta Cyclones. All of a sudden, I've been trying to talk about it. Listen, yeah, listen. Not been quiet. It has been a slow start to the season. <laughs> We're still early. We're not punting on the season. Didn't you say today's a must-win game? I'm, it's like I, game three, isn't it? I don't know if I said must-win. Today's a biggie because we're playing a team that we feel we're better than. I've dubbed it our Waterloo. Right. It's <laughs> look, Jesus. These that aren't seems happy, big. These aren't happy times right now. The team that we drafted, we felt great about. Uh, it has not panned out so far. No we, one's played up to par. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Like I'm not gonna say who's been bad, who's name been names. good. We've, we've, no, we've had, no we've had, it's not we've time had, for that yet. Name it's, names. Look, this this is a locker room thing, and we, we're dealing with it internally. But we've had some injuries and we've had a tough schedule, oh, no. but we also don't make excuses. Everyone's hurt this time of year in the fronton. Are you Napoleon or are they Napoleon? We'll find out today. Do you 5 have p.m. I think Flores might is be this, Napoleon. Is this an internet thing? Like you can watch it? Yes. yes. How you do you can watch, watch every it? ESPN Plus. ESPN Plus. Okay. ESPN Three. Every single one of the the highlight battle court games are available on the ESPN Plus platform. Ooh. Check us out. It's a big one. We're going up against Williams. Our oh. former Cyclone, we miss you so much. This one hurts. Well, this one hurts. Why'd you let him go? Yeah, I mean, we had to. It's a weird... It's a, it's a keeper system. You can uh, only keep so many guys. No uh, accountability from this front office, from what I can see. So, yeah. so much excuse Look, making. It's early it's in the year. Like you can't just so, pick two random dudes to so, pick a team in the sport they know nothing about. So you guys, <laughs> you guys want us to just... like? I don't want to... to the easy there, pal. We've made it to every single final yeah. so far. I mean, yeah, we, we yeah. won. Uh, we're, the power, uh, we're the power. We're the powerhouse in this league. Yeah, like up we're to this point. We're the gold standard. Yeah, and right, right now we're we got new players in the fold, and it takes some some times. So like doubles pairings, this stuff takes time. It's uh, but it's clearly Mike's fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, we're just doing the owner thing Wait, back and forth. Why are you just kidding? 
thing. It I'm is. Just, Mike drafted the team. No, no we both no, drafted. We, he let Williams go. The best. The I thing. Mean, the, here's the little secret: is we we were never more informed than this draft. So if there's ever a time to blame us, like the first couple seasons, it was kind of just no like I don't know anything. You, you guys pick it. Yeah. And this this year, we got opinionated. Well, dude, hold on a second. Wait, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. No one saw CRB becoming a backcourt player. That's true. I, he was on my do not draft list. And Bradley's wrist been hurting him, so we we think he's going to come around. His game is all power, and obviously the power's not been there just yet. We're going to shake it off, and we need you. We need your overwhelming support from a distance. Our team can feel that, especially on days when and, the front on is totally empty, like and, today. And you know what we have to do? <laughs> this is me talking to the team right now. You need to win. Catch the bleeping pelota. There yeah. it is. All right? The basics. We talk, the basics. we talk about power. We talk about angles. We talk about all the fancy stuff. Yeah. Catch the bleeping pelota. I'm going to I'm going to go the other way on this. Be Just careful. he's going with the basics. I want you all Cyclone Nation to transport yourself back to the Basque country. Just a man, a pelota and a clay wall. Yeah. That's what that that's why you got into this game. All right? Yep. So just go be that boy that grew up on the French Riviera just for hours on end bouncing a pelota off a fronton wall. Let's all do the call. Manu. You guys, you guys. Manu. Manu. The most like you whales. The most you knew is when you drafted Manu. the most new poorly. Uh, they we've, still, we've uh, up against, guys, we've gone up against the uh, Robote Renegades, who are the gold standard now because they are the defending I thought champion. You were, yeah, and you then the Wall be. Warriors, who was our, our, our look. I wasn't the person that stood up in the in the restaurant and said "fuck the Wall Warriors" and motivated them to win their next that two against Chris us. Cody. You did try to talk the team into drafting Bradley, though. <laughs> yeah, wow. well, he's he's obvious. He's clearly hurt. It's unraveling. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I love Bradley. Catch the ball. He's the guy.